Hi, my name is Mikhail Jewel Iverson. I'm a media and uh, social impact entrepreneur. Um, and I'm pleased to uh, be here on the Inspiring Leadership Show with uh, Jonathan Bowman Perks. Well, Mikhail, thank you very much. It's great to have you here. You were recommended by Rara Plumtree, who is a very generous lady who sees good in people and people who, like you, put a lot back into society. And she's great at connecting us. So, Miguel, I'm just interested in your sort of a little nutshell of your journey into leadership. So here you are. Just perhaps explain a bit about what you're doing under one sky, because it's it's awesome as the founder of this organization. So give us a little flavor of that. And, and what's been your journey from growing up in a small hamlet of 30 people in Denmark? All right. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, with Under One Sky, Under One Sky is a nonprofit organization uh, supporting the homeless uh, in London and also now in Brighton and a few other places. And uh, what we do is extremely simple. We do what we call skywalks, where we have teams that go out primarily uh, at night uh, where we meet uh, the, the homeless where they are staying for that evening. And then we offer them uh, companionship, chat, um, food and drink and any other supplies that they might need. Um, so it's a really simple concept, but um, actually also surprisingly powerful, uh, but we'll probably get onto that later. Um, the, the sort of unique thing about this organization and, and, um, and running it is that we're an organization that's got about 1400 volunteers in our database. Um, but we don't have any employees. So uh, my leadership challenge is to run this organization and motivate people to actually at the moment be out on the streets every night um, without uh, any other tools than uh, you know, actually trying to create an environment where people want to do this. So um, yeah, so that's what we're, that's what we're doing at, at Under One Sky at the moment. Um, and. Uh, We'll probably get on to a little bit more uh, about the future later on. Um, it's been a it's been a long journey getting to here uh, and an interesting journey. So as you mentioned, I'm Danish. I grew up uh, on the Danish west coast in a in a in in a hamlet. There was about thirty people where I grew up, uh, and I actually lived there until my my early twenties. Uh, I had a few stints in other places. Um, but one thing that uh, was clear to me from being a very young child was that I always knew that I had to get out in the world. Uh, and when you're five, six years old, uh, you don't know what that means. But um, I always had the sense that I had to, 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 to go somewhere other than where I was. Um, and so uh, as I grew older, uh, I was eventually looking at whether I should go to the UK or go to the US and basically uh, study for a master's degree. Uh, and I ended up uh, going to London. Um, prior to that, actually, I spent six months in, in Glasgow, uh, finishing off my, my bachelor degree there. Uh, and then I went to London and, and studied at LSE, uh, studied finance. And um, that's how my, my journey into uh, professional work life started. Um, it actually started in the worst worst way possible, to be honest with you, <laughs> because uh, I was uh, I was sort of gunning for getting a, a job in a big investment bank, like all my 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 friends at the university. Uh, that didn't happen. I so I ended up uh, working in a, a smaller financial services company doing equity research to uh, for sort of retail investors. That was when online investing was just kicking off. Um, and about 12 months after starting that job, the dot-com bubble burst in 2000, and uh, we were venture capital funded, and the funding uh, went. Uh, and so I had to go and find another, another place of employment. Um, I then moved into commodities trading, trading energy commodities like uh, natural gas, electricity, and so on, um, working for a big US company. And about 12 months after starting that, um, Enron folded. And Enron was the market. And so uh, they were letting people go. And um, clearly not great, uh, but uh, I actually think that uh, it's helped me in my career going forward um, because that then made me take a shift. I uh, went from there to actually going to LA to go to film school. 
and came back and started working in, in, in media and entertainment. Spent about uh, probably about 12 years working for Universal Studios, eventually internationally. And then I left the company and uh, started working on my own entrepreneurial adventures, uh, of which uh, has now led me to where I am today, where I run a company called Terra Media with a business partner, uh, where we focus on social impact entertainment. Um, I'm also still doing some consulting in the media space, um, currently working with NBC Universal, actually. And, uh, and then I also run uh, Under One Sky. So you're so a busy, busy man. Busy man. Yeah, there's quite a lot going on. I'm actually. I also have a couple of couple of film projects that I'm that I'm producing. So uh, so that just comes on top. Wow. Do you have any time for any any social life? Any friends? Any family? Or just you on your own? Well, I got a wife, and I have a I have an 18 year old, uh, 18 18 months old uh, child. Um, so I need to make time for family, of course, and uh, I also want to do that. Um, at the moment, it's it's a special time, obviously, because of the situation with uh, that we're in with uh, with COVID nineteen and lockdown and so on. Um, and uh, because of all the work we're doing in Under One Sky, uh, that's really become an extended family. And we've always run with the concept of it being a family. So there's um, there's a lot of interaction every day. Uh, so I'm by no means sitting at home feeling lonely. <laughs> you definitely won't be. And and in your, as you look back on your life, what, what have been one moment of great joy and happiness? And what's been a moment of great darkness and sadness? And what did you learn as a leader from each of those experiences? Um, actually, I would say they're connected because it was the moment of darkness that probably led to the biggest shift in my life. And so um, I spoke about um, being at an energy uh, trading company and debt folding. Around that time, I didn't know what I was going to do. And I was actually looking at structuring some financial products um, for, uh, for sort of private investors. So looking at some of the things I've done before. My wife uh, at the time worked in a, in a shop and she had a customer who came in and they ended up talking and uh, she invited him for dinner. So we had dinner, he'd worked in the film industry all his life. Uh, and he was also um, quite, quite into meditation. And so he actually did two things. One was to suggest that I look at the film industry. Um, and that was a bit of a eureka moment for me because it sort of had the qualities that I was looking for in a career. But he also um, actually had, had us starting to meditate. At the same time, um, I had a, a, a quite a serious physical uh, issue. Um, I'd had back pain and sciatica for two years um, to the point where every morning I had to roll out of bed to kind of teach my body how to walk again before getting to work. And um, one thing is the physical pain, but the other thing is what the physical pain does to your mental state um, because uh, it just keeps on kind of digging into, in, into your mind. So that was, quite, that was a dark moment for me. You know, I, I, I tried, you know, basically jump. I thought I was, I was standing there waiting to have a glowing career in, in finance. And I'd been through two redundancies in three years. I also had a body that wasn't functioning. And to be honest with you, I, I didn't have, the foggiest idea of where I was going. Um, but at around that same time, as I mentioned, I met this guy, he suggested the film industry um, and he, he, he got me into, into meditation practice. I also at the time decided, okay, if I can't find a way of uh, getting, getting uh, sort of beyond this physical problem, I need to get an operation. So I went to the local bookstore, I bought all the books they had on back pain and I uh, went home and I started reading saying, okay, I'm gonna read this and if it doesn't work, then I'm gonna go under the knife. Um, and I, I picked up the first book and I read it for about 20 minutes and I looked down and I, I was reading with the straight left leg and I hadn't been able to sit on a chair and straighten my leg for two years. So I realized something was going on here 
within three months of actually just reading the book and journaling, I'd cured myself of the issue. Um, and at the same time, I'd taken up this meditation practice. And um, shortly after that, I, the best way I can describe it is I had a voice that came to me saying, your passion is people. And that moment in time is the moment that I changed my path. Wow. It, it doesn't mean that I, you know, I went and did everything different, but I was suddenly had the realization that that was what my life was going to be about. And you said my wife at that time was working in a shop. Now, was that your wife at that time and you have a different wife or your wife at that time was working in a shop? I wasn't quite sure which of the two. Let me let me clarify that so that I'm not getting into any, any issues. Um, she was my girlfriend at the time. She's my wife today. Right. right. So uh, yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. OK. And so um, amazing that you had sort of a mind over matter of physical that the way you were reading about things and you were realizing that maybe there was a connection between the fact two redundancies in three years and psychosomatically it was seizing your body up. You didn't want to move. And that actually when you began to address how you thought it affected physiologically how you were I've, it's not the first time i've come across this is that what i understood was happening for you absolutely yes yeah. so i actually realized that uh, it was it was mental stuff that was manifesting physically yeah um and as i started working with that mental stuff and it wasn't like even to this day it was i couldn't sort of i can't put my finger on exactly what but I think it's more about certain characteristics that you have as a person who um, that actually ends up creating this, um, this situation. Yeah, yeah. I, and it's, it's very interesting. I, I've done quite a lot of mindfulness and meditation myself, but I've particularly started a 365 day program of meditating mm -hmm. every day. And I've been doing it only for perhaps two months now in that way, never missing a day beginning with 10 minutes, going to 15, now 20. And it's the first thing I do in the day. Uh, and, and I find it's fundamentally changed the way I show up, how I interact with people yeah. because of that focus. So I, I completely relate to that. Taking yourself back to the young 18 year old Mikhail, um, what bit of advice with all the wisdom and experience you've learned from your successes, your failures, setting up a, a an incredible movement in Under One Sky, helping all these people who are homeless. What bit of advice would you give to the young Mikhail if you met yourself again, the younger you? What, what one tip would you give a young person today that you learned now? Um, the, the tip I would give that, uh, that, that younger version is um, learn to be the master of your ego. Because I, I, I luckily realized quite early in my life, probably in my early 20s, that what was going to get between, get in the way of what I wanted to achieve, if anything, was my ego. Yeah. So um, with that realization, I actually tried to put myself into situations where I knew I was not going to be the best at something or where I would be out of place to uh, to really work on on saying to you, you go it's 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 fine you know you don't have to you don't have to deliver all the time um and and so that's the that's the message that i'd give myself as a as a younger the younger version wise bit of wise words and and so we're getting around the inspiring leadership compass starting with mq moral quotient integrity value principles beliefs what have been your foundational values because of the experiences you've had in life growing up in Denmark and then wanting to, to go out into the world, do things, tried various things, went to LSE, end up NBC Universal, a whole range of different experiences you've had. What are your foundational values that you aspire to live by? You might let them slip, but, but if there's two or three or four or five values, what are they? I. I fundamentally believe that that humankind is one family. Um, and so that means that regardless of what you look like, uh, what your religion is, what your cultural heritage is and so on, it, it, we're still one family. And that's something that I was brought up with from my, uh, you know, from my parents. Um, I was quite lucky to grow up in a, in a, 
in a household where there weren't too many preconceived ideas uh, about you know religion or uh, sort of strong political views um so it's that um it's it's kind of yeah embracing that inclusiveness yep um what else it's it, it's it's and then take taking from from there really you know treating everyone with the same way you know uh, every everyone's an equal soul so everyone deserves the same level of integrity um and integrity so integrity is, is is one of the key things that under one sky you know that you because with integrity comes trust if you believe that people are you know doing the right thing then you start building a trusting relationship so um so so that thing about um treating everyone the same and treating everyone with that dignity and respect regardless of the situation are two key things uh, and one of the i think one of the best things about it is it might it makes your life so much richer because you're inviting all people in as yeah. opposed to choosing i i think that's a beautifully put and 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 we look at the inspiring leadership compass it's the inspiring leader when they're integrated it's every bit connected they're working on all parts and we're always work in progress i'm never the complete product i always got bits i need to improve and constantly growing but when you're not and bits are missing you're the disintegrated leader mm -hmm. and when it disintegrates you've seen that with some of the people who are homeless their lives mentally or physically have disintegrated probably you might find quite a number of ex servicemen who i might have yeah. served with who um, have fallen on harder times and fall further and harder when they've not been in that environment where they're being supported or maybe they've got PTSD or problems from some of the battle zones that they've been in. Um, am, am I right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's, uh, there's quite a, a, a good proportion of people out there who have come from, uh, from, a, from an army background. And uh, one of the, actually, one of the, one of the stories that actually that, that always sticks in my mind was um, uh, one of our teams met a, a couple of it by Camden tube station some years ago. And he, um, the, the guy there had served in Afghanistan. And while he was there, he got a message from back home that, had, that his wife and two uh, daughters had been killed in a car crash. And so he comes back and of course his world falls apart. And it's a story that I like to tell, to send the message that you never, you never judge a book by its cover. Uh, even, I mean, firstly, we said don't judge at all, but this is just another reminder to say, you have no idea what, you know, what the person sitting there has been through. And the truth of the matter is most of the people that you see on the streets, they have been through some harrowing times. Yeah, yeah, uh, I just, Time and again, I, I remind myself, let alone anybody else, to have good judgment, but don't be judgmental. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I was luckily brought up by a mother who, although we had very little money and we'd grown up in a caravan, my father was killed when I was three. And so uh, suddenly our whole world imploded and a 33 year old mother had three boys under the age of nine and mm -hmm. no more support from the forces and just a very small pension because you get half the pension that the man was due. Oh. And um, she, she found it very hard. Um, but even so, I remember on the way coming back from church, um, she was more brought up Quaker, but more Church of England. There would be some lady who was homeless and would be smelling strongly of urine because she hadn't had much of a cleanup for some days. And mother would just check what was she doing and had she had any food and she hadn't. And so she'd come home with us. Yeah. And we'd move around and we'd just make the food go a bit further. Uh, and that stays with me all my life, which is why when my wife, Lee, set up a charity for vulnerable girls, modern day slavery, trafficking, uh, abuse and uh, problems like that in London and elsewhere, um, I, I completely relate to what and support what she does. Um, and so I really respect uh, what you're doing under one sky, which is why Rara Plumtree thought there'd be a good connection. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, Michael, just going on to the next element of the eight parts of the compass, PQ, purpose, meaning. 
um, you know, people's dharma, their journey, their vocation, their calling. Why yeah. do you, Mikhail, do what you're doing? And there's a variety of things you're doing, but why do you do it? So it really links back to that point in time that I mentioned where I got this epiphany that came and said, you're, you're passionate people. Before that, um, I, you know, I, I, I can see how the way I treated people that um, I probably had those sort of qualities. Uh, I was often the person that if someone had to speak privately, um, I would be that person that, that, that you'd have that conversation with. But it was only really when um, I realized this thing about my, my, my journey being about people that I could work with it and take it serious. And um, what I've then seen in hindsight is that I, I went through various training schemes, meeting people on my way who needed help in, in, um, in different ways. Um, and, you know, I think there's something in um, starting to appreciate that you can help people without being an expert, that simply by your presence and by what you, you know, your, your born gifts and skills, that you can be of value to someone else. And, um, and that's actually a, one of the most powerful messages as well when we speak about uh, working with, you know, pe vulnerable people like people on the street. Uh, Oftentimes, uh, people will say, well, I can't just stop and talk to a person. I need to give the person something, which is that, you know, conditioned transactional mindset where you don't feel that you're of any value unless, unless you're, you're passing something material. Um, and that's actually one of the messages that we're trying to do with Run One Sky is saying the most valuable thing you can give is time and presence. Um, and so... It's, it, it's kind of like when you found that purpose, uh, well, you can't run away from it. You don't want to run away from it. And uh, then it's just really reveling in the fact that you have gotten such a clear message through. Yes. You know what your life can be about. So, so good, Mikhail. And, and I'm reminded of, as parents, you know, and I've got two stepchildren, two children of my own, uh, who are now 25 to 29. And they don't, they don't want my presence. They want my presence. Yeah. And, and, and that's what the people, whenever I stop to talk to someone, um, I tend to always, if I'm going to do something, go and, go and buy them some food and bring them some food. But I, I tend to avoid giving money mm -hmm. uh, because of when working with certain drug agencies and drug charities, they said, please don't give money because it, it will then be their next fix. But talk to them. Um, give give them some food or something like that, um, but but just be more careful on that. And, and talking about uh, people's situations, whether it's drugs or mental health issues or like that, health quotient is the next element. Um, what what have what have you personally done as a leader to look after your own health and well being? You talked about getting repairing your back and the psychosomatic connections and how by sorting out how you think about yourself, you're able to sort out your physiology and yeah. how meditation and mindfulness has really helped focus the old prefrontal cortex and how you're focused on doing things that, that really follow the epiphany that you had. Um, how about the connection between physical and mental? What's, what's uh, helping you now? Um, so the way, the way I see everything is that everything's connected. So everything that happens uh, to you from a physical perspective probably started in, uh, in, in, in thought form. So um, just as I experienced, actually my physical ailment was, a, was coming from a, a, a mental place. So um, I, think it's, I think it's very much about, you know, uh, for me having established that connection and that understanding um, that um, that's that's how it works. Um, with regards to keeping a clear path in terms of that mental health, I think what I what I've sort of tried to do over the years, starting with meditation, but now I now I more try to see meditation in every step I take. So um, where everything in, that I try to do in life is is a form of meditation. 
uh, where you uh, take every step in a in a sort of in a spirit and a level of consciousness of who's around you, what's around you, paying uh, gratitude and respect to that, um, and and always you know always trying to be open. Yeah, no, that's that's a, a lovely way of putting it. And so from health to IQ, decision making, wisdom, judgment. Um, who do you go to when you need to try and work through some tough decisions? Have you got some good people who give you advice? Have you got a mentor? Have you got a coach? Who who helps you? Um, I don't have a I, I don't have a coach or a mentor as such, and I think that uh, it's probably a little bit of horses for courses, depending on the decision that I need to make. Um, probably the best coach or mentor I have, as I've learned throughout the year, is probably my heart. And my gut and saying, um, you know, it takes courage to take that step where you where you start making decisions on what feels right, as opposed to something that you can document and say, well, X, Y, Z is why I, I why why I made this decision. Um, and um, I think one of the I think one of the liberating things on 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 my sort of leadership journey about, uh, you know, working in an organization like Under One Sky is that um, uh, it's decision-making at a completely different level. Uh, it's much more, of, um, uh, it's much more heart-centered uh, decision-making. Um, and because we don't have any, we don't have any employees, everyone's a volunteer. It's really about, you um, making decisions from a, from a sort of, from a place of empathy and um, yeah, trying to, uh, trying to work that way. Yeah, no, that's good. And then from there on to EQ, which is um, uh, six times or five times rather more um, influential to people's performance in life and in their job. IQ is important, but EQ uh, carries a factor of five times more important in people's performance. And there's you, you've been to LSE, you've been with some very clever people in finance, but some of them are very high IQ, but they haven't yet started to develop their EQ, as you probably will agree that uh, number you come across. Um, what have you done to develop your rapport, your listening skills, your uh, emotional and social intelligence? I think I've been quite lucky in the sense that I grew up in a place, as I mentioned, that was surrounded by nature, um, which uh, later on in life I've realized has been extremely grounding for me. So it does, it, it, it takes quite a lot for me to kind of start swerving in the wind. Um, I also grew up in a family where I, where I had a lot of freedom, but also love was in abundance. So that has given me a very solid foundation to build on from an, from an emotional perspective. Um, and then I really think it's been, especially in the sort of, in the last probably 15 years of my life when I, when I found my purpose, that um, I also started embracing some of those, uh, you know, qualities around um, emotional intelligence and so on that often can be paired back otherwise in the normal work situation and and just really try to pour that out I mean um, for me honestly it's life is a journey of, of love and learning um, and just sharing that widely I think what I mentioned before about becoming a master of your ego also means that um, when you do that, you also, and of course, I'm not a complete master of my ego, no one is, it's a continuous struggle, right? But it means that it's okay to be vulnerable. Yeah. And it, it, you can't show the best of what you have before you take that armor off. Uh, it, it is so interesting. Um, I, I have had to learn that lesson a lot. And I, I think, so keen to please and prove myself and show how good I was in early life. Um, and it's only now in later life as I approach 60 that I'm starting to be much more vulnerable, much more 
authentic than I used to be and okay to make mistakes and only the strong can be vulnerable is very much a belief I've learned. And as I find, as I am more vulnerable myself, I find other people are vulnerable around me. Um, and we have conversations on a level that we've never had before. And I found even that in our conversation before this and during this session, you've been very vulnerable, you've been very open. And I appreciate that. Have you found the same as you're more vulnerable? Others feel it psychologically safe to open up to? Completely. I mean, I think that's the, then you become a safe harbor, right? Which means, which means your life becomes a lot richer because no one wants to know about the stuff that you know and can see. Like you, you know, if as a friend, I want to help people when they have a real problem. And so it's a privilege when someone has the courage or gives you the privilege to actually uh, become part of that, that, you know, journey and challenge and, and, and problem solving. So I completely agree that when you emanate an energy of grounded, um, just a grounded, uncomplicated love, to be honest with you, yeah, then people feel in, in good hands. Yeah, uh, so, so true, which, which goes on to the next element, which is resilience, the, uh, the last of the three. Um, and when you've had challenges, uh, and you know, you've had those tough times of being made redundant twice, uh, what have you learned about, about resilience through, through your life and your experiences? which you've been able to help as you like helping other people, uh, what would be a, a bit of wisdom on resilience that you've learned? I think what I've learned throughout this journey and as my life has opened up is that I, you know, I think we're all cosmic beings. I think we're a part of something what much bigger. And um, when we think about us in the, in the grand scheme of things, our issues, uh, suddenly pale in that uh, that respect. Uh, the other thing is, I believe that um, you know, life is a, is a, is a journey of, of growth and learning. So if I don't have difficult times, if I don't have challenges, clearly I'm <laughs> I'm not ready for the next step of growth. So I actually welcome it in. Uh, I think now one of my mantras is that whatever happens in my life, I need to be able to laugh about it. Yeah, um, because I don't. Um, it's one of those things where I think if you take life too serious, you stop living because this, you go into freeze mode. Yeah, this is so true. There's some research recently that, that people who have a boss with a sense of fun and who can laugh at himself or herself, 27% 20, more effective and productive in them. Uh -huh. And I know that when I've been coaching CEOs or top teams or managing directors, when I'm with a boss who has a sense of fun mm. and, and admits when he gets things wrong, yeah. people love working for that man or woman, but when they're so intense and serious and they never believe they make a mistake and they have no humor whatsoever, mm. it's really dry yeah. and tough <laughs> for people to work there and they can't yeah. understand the connection. Um, the last two, brand and then legacy, uh, your brand, your reputation, your image, your impact, it's, it's what people say about you when you're not in the room, Mikhail. Now, people say you're very inspiring in the way you've, you've started Under One Sky and the work you've done in, in film production. Just what an interesting person you are. What, what do you do to learn from feedback from other people to continue this process of growth, learning and laughing at yourself? I think it's... Um... I think it's, it's partly about just staying curious about life, about continuing to invite the conversation. Um, because whenever, you know, whoever you're, you're with is also a mirror to yourself. And so the more you can meet with different people and get different vantage points of your own, of your own being, the more you learn. Um, of course, if you genuinely come from a place of, I'm here to have a good time. I'm here to learn. I'm here to help others. Life becomes extremely uncomplicated. And so, so I do feel that my life in many, many respects is, is, is very uncomplicated because yeah. I'm really just here to, uh, you know, take a swing for humanity, to be honest with you yeah. and, have, and have fun doing it. 
Yeah. Well, in all that you do, you must have a very understanding wife and uh, 18 month old. I've just become a grandfather. So we've got a congratulations, a four week old. Thank you. It's, uh, <laughs> very exciting. Daniel and Kirsty have this little uh, baby Grace. Um, and in some ways, your 18 month old is, is your legacy. Your, your wife is part of your legacy, how you help them and all the people, the 33,000 times that you've helped the homeless uh, on the streets of London and elsewhere. Um, but what would you like your legacy to be in your lifetime, not after you've died, but during however long your life will be? What would you like your legacy to be? Uh, the way I always describe legacy is legacy, legacy is uh, the seeds you plant in others. You know, and so the so what I would like my legacy to be is inspiring, supporting, encouraging people to really grab life by the scruff of its neck and do with it what you really want to do. Because most people have, you know, we can all feel, you know, we have a drive towards something, we gravitate towards something, but but often we're stopped in our tracks because we don't think we can do it or the circumstances aren't right. And um, so what I'd love to do is to actually help people get the courage and, uh, you know, to, to, to actually pursue that. And, um, and also to, I think for me, it's very much about opening up, open up, opening up people's minds, opening up people's hearts, opening up people's hands to help others, and actually opening up the understanding that we're part of a, we're part of a big universe. Yeah. Lovely. So that we, you know, because you have to connect to find that purpose. And when you find your purpose, life becomes a joy. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Lovely. So um, we, we talked earlier about the book, um, Mind Body Syndrome. Would yeah. that be one that you'd recommend people read? Can you remember who the author was or they can just look it up on Amazon? Is that the name of the book? Did I hear right? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so the book is called The Mind-Body Syndrome and it's by, a, uh, it's, it's by a guy called John Sarno, Dr. John Sarno. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, if you, if you were to go into my Amazon account, you'll see loads of different addresses in my address book. And that's because I've sent this book to so many people. I probably sent it to somewhere between 30 and 50 people. Uh, and even just last night, I, I uh, shared, shared this same uh, advice with someone else. Good. Well, I will make sure that I have a read of it. Mm. And, and if you go to my website, jonathanperks.com, not only will you be seeing later on your own podcast in video, but also uh, in Apple and Spotify when it gets published uh, and some, some, some script about you, which people can read but also in the next page along is my book reviews. Uh -huh. uh, and there's various books in there that I would recommend to you in return, but I'll make sure that um, before the year is out, I've got a, a long list of other audio books. I'm dyslexic, so I listen to audio books. I hope Dr. John Sarno has got a mind body syndrome in audio books. Uh, I'll have a look and see if, Thank I, you, can, <laughs> see if I can find it. Okay. Hello, yeah. that, that's, that's great. And then let's now end, as we agreed we would do, with your top tips. So if you just, uh, again, introduce yourself, because this will be both in the podcast and as a standalone, introduce yourself and what you do and what your top tip is, then we'll round up with that. Okay. Um, so three, two, one. My name is uh, Mikkel Jewell Iverson. I'm a media and social impact entrepreneur, uh, and I'm pleased to be on the Inspiring Leadership Show by uh, Jonathan Bowman Perks. My top tip is uh, open up yourself to the world. Open your mind, open your heart, invite people in, imp invite impressions in, because that's what's gonna make your life richer. Um, and yeah, life is a learning journey. So the more you, the more you open up, the more you learn. Thanks, Mikhail. That's a fantastic tip. 